Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am delighted to introduce this virtual event with Louis Menand presenting his latest book, The Free World, Art and Thought in the Cold War, in conversation with David Leonard. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community. Every week we host events here on our Zoom account. Next month we'll feature events with Francis Fukuyama, Michael Lewis, and Jane Goodall with Peter Volben. Please check out the event schedule on our website at harvard.com slash events. And while you're there, you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, please click on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen or wherever it appears on your Zoom platform and we will get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I will be posting a link to purchase copies of The Free World from harvard.com as well as a link to donate in support of the series and of our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Harvard Square. We thank you so much for showing up and tuning in in support, not only of our authors, but also of the truly fantastic staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And lastly, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over the past year, technical issues may arise. We hope they do not, of course, but if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. And we thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now I am so pleased to introduce our speakers. Louis Menand is Lee Simpkins Family Professor of Arts and Sciences and Anne T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of English at Harvard University. He is the author of several books, including The Marketplace of Ideas and The Metaphysical Club, which won the 2002 Pulitzer Prize in History. He is also a longtime staff writer for The New Yorker. David Leonard is president of the Boston Public Library and he leads the 170 year old institution, one of Boston's great educational, cultural and civic treasures. Appointed president by the library's board of trustees and Mayor Walsh in June, 2016, David's focus is on developing the BPL as a 21st century institution, providing dynamic library experiences to the residents of Boston, of Massachusetts and beyond. They will be discussing Louis Menand's new book, The Free World, Art and Thought in the Cold War, a sweeping cultural history from the years following World War II to the Vietnam War. By the end of the Vietnam era, the American government had lost the moral prestige it had enjoyed at the end of World War II, but America's once despised culture had become respected and adored. Jack Hamilton praises in his Slate review, The Free World is an engrossing and often revelatory book, a capacious, ambitious, and wonderfully crafted synthesis of intellectual and cultural history. I'm so pleased to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Luke and Dave. Thank you. Thanks so I much, say, Mel. Um, I want to say my personal thanks to the Harvard Bookstore for doing this, and also to David for agreeing to uh, talk to me. Um, happy to be here. Uh, in fact, uh, thrilled to be doing this as a collaboration between BPL and the Harvard bookstores. Uh, I think we can all acknowledge that public libraries and independent bookstores are indeed essential resources in the support of reading, literacy, and curious inquiry, which we'll be exploring a little bit um, tonight. Um, Luke, this is a this is quite a tome. Um, I'm I'm interested to start out by. Um, just wondering what brought you to the Cold War period and what got the, the book going for you? It's, you know, books often uh, take form in peculiar ways and sometimes the seed gets planted in your head and then after a couple of years you realize you're going to have to do something with it. And in this case, I taught a class, this is more than 20 years ago when I was teaching in New York for graduate students on the 60s. And uh, I thought it was a really successful seminar. And at the end of the semester, I went as the students if they would be interested in if I wrote a book about the 60s. And they all said no. I actually went around the room and they all said no. So they, they already knew everything they needed to know about the 60s? Kind of. 
Well, kind of. I mean, the things that seem very revolutionary in the 60s, like making a painting of a Campbell's soup can yeah. in 1999, that's like, you know, everybody knows you can do that. Yeah. But so I said, well, you seemed interested in what we were talking about. What, what interested you? They said the stuff you said about the 50s was interesting. And I realized that was sort of foreign territory for them. They, they, there, those were ideas that they didn't inherit exactly. So it made me interested in trying to tell the story starting with the end of the Second World War. And then when I sat down to write it, I just started there in 1945 and had it planned to end in 1965, which is when the U.S. intervened militarily in Vietnam, and just kind of figure out what the story was by writing it. And I found that was a story there. So it was, it was you know, I learned a lot by just writing the book. Uh, I didn't go in with a very preconceived idea of it, but I felt that it was worth bringing all these people back to life again. No, and um, I think th there's a little personal story as to why this period is is particularly relevant. Um, also, if I remember from the introduction. Yeah. Oh, well, I was born in 1952, in case you haven't guessed. And uh, my parents were intellectuals who were very interested in politics. Um, they their cultural tastes were fairly conservative, like that they read Trollope novels and stuff. But they, but they knew what was going on. So when I was growing up, you know, I was a kid, but I had heard of Jackson Pollock and John Cage and Hannah Arendt and Lionel Trilling and most of the people who ended up in my book. Um, but I was too young to really understand very much about them. But I, you know, the names were familiar to me. So the question I asked myself was, what was it about these people, like John Cage, for example, such that my parents knew about it, uh, or Jackson Pollock, um, and. Uh, and, and then I also felt, in a way, these people formed the environment, as it were, the cultural environment in which I you know, grew up. So it was a way of understanding my own subjectivity in a way. Um, so, so there was a personal reason for writing. It's, that's not a reason for you to read it, but, but, but it actually was it, was, it was fun for me because this was some part of my past that I didn't know very well. Well, I, I think... Um just thinking about when America in the 20th century truly evolves and emerges onto the world stage in a new way. That is clearly what happens both during and then after World War II. Um, so I think there's a there's a very much a logical um, choice there in terms of trying to run some through lines between um, then and now, just just uh, trying to explore how did we, how did we get where we are today? And there's clearly you know, it's, there are always arbitrary starting points for that, but a, but an interesting one is to to pick up the story uh, immediately post World War II in this, you know, uh, period of the Cold War. Um, yeah. yeah, that's what I felt. Like. Oh, when you get to 1965, right, in this story, you're kind of in the world that we're in now. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, it, it certainly uh, begins with, with, with Vietnam and then the, the 60s. But but the 60s, as we find in the book, have their roots in what was happening in the in the decade before. Of course. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. So that, that makes a good story. Yeah. Um, so so the Cold War, um, um, that's a, an ominous sort of um, um, title or subtitle to have. Um, and um, you know, I think we, we can think of, of, of the Cold War as that period, you know, not immediately following, but almost immediately following um, uh, World War II. Yeah. And some people would say it runs through the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89, or, you know, some of the, the European transitions, 89, 91. Yeah. Um, so it's really the first part of the Cold War. Would that be, would that be fair to, yeah, to talk about? So, right. So, yeah, the Cold War doesn't come to an end until 1990, really, when the Soviet Union implodes. Um, yeah. But, and you're right, that doesn't begin right after the war, but by 1947, it's in place. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of the literature on the Cold War is about the first 20 years. We think of that as the Cold War era. Um, it still goes on. There's still an arms race. A lot of the issues that are present in the earlier period continue, but it becomes less of a domestic issue. People aren't terribly worried about rooting out communists in the government or whatever, and it's less ideological. It becomes more of an arms race, and the impact is more overseas. So, uh, so this, but this is a period when the when the people of the United States are concerned or obsessed with their relations with the Soviet Union, um, and so it's very much in the atmosphere of this period. Vietnam then changes the subject in a way, 
Um, and we're, we're focused on art and thought as two unifying themes. I mean, there are, there are, I think, 18 sections or topics or characters that we're primarily exploring in the book. Could you just tell us a little bit about how that came to? to yeah, to uh, so there are 18 chapters and each chapter has uh, one or two or three for protagonists, leading figures, and is about a particular subject. Um, and each chapter is kind of written as though it's an independent book. Uh, um, so there's, it's not as though it's a chain of paper dolls in which one chapter inevitably leads to the next and there's a continuous uh, sort of a stream of thought or something like that. It doesn't work that way at all, I think, historically. It's very zigzag. So the book is very zigzag. Um, you, you do come out somewhere, I think, when you get to the end, you kind of look back and think, oh, this is what happened. But the form I tell it in, I go from one thing to another. Um, and the way it worked was that when I started working on the book, started writing it, um, the obvious place to begin was George Kennan, because Kennan is the author of the policy of containment, as everybody knows, and that was basically the policy of the US during the first 20 years of the Cold War, and it reaches a crisis in Vietnam. So that was a good way to begin, put the first frame in place. And then really I asked myself, so what should the next chapter be about? Or what? What would the next? What must the next chapter be about? I thought it has to be about 1984. I wrote a chapter about that, and I thought, well, what should the next chapter be about? What must it be about? It has to be about existentialism. So I wrote about that. So the chapters. I mean, eventually, I got a clear picture of what the chapters were going to be. But in a way, I wanted to let the material dictate to me what the sequence of stories was that I was going to tell, uh, and not try to guess ahead too far about where it was going to go. And, it, and I, it, to me, it worked. That is to say, to me, the sequence of things that I talk about end up lining up in a way that gets you from one end of the period to the other. Um, but, I, but I really, really didn't, um, I didn't have an outline to begin with. I kind of followed my nose through the, through the period. Well, I think, I think once you realize right. what's happening, it becomes much more intriguing um, yeah. because, well, wait, well, we have George Kennan, we have George Orwell, we, we have um, uh, the Beatles, we have Susan Sontag, and we have a whole through line around existentialism and Jean-Paul Sartre and, and yeah. others. So uh, yeah. I just think it's a better way to do history because you're not, I get very impatient with generalizations about any period, the Cold War period or any other period. Everything has to fit in underneath that generalization. It just doesn't. I think people, that's not how people think. Um, and you're trying to capture the way people were thinking. That's what I'm trying to do anyway. What was James Baldwin thinking when he did this or that? What was Hannah Arendt thinking when she wrote this book? Um, what were the Beatles thinking? Um, and when you try to get inside the heads of the protagonists of the story, you get an insight into what the atmosphere was like and what people were doing and thinking about. Um, you know, one question that painters have to ask is, what is a painting? What does it mean to make a painting? Um, that's of course Jackson Pollock asked. So that you have to kind of get inside that, that in that space when you're writing, and if you come in with a preconceived idea about what those paintings meant, you're going to miss that. And we're at a period where there's still quite a structured approach to art forms. It's not yet the the more free form, open format that uh, that arises a little bit later uh, that we would characterize in the 60s and 70s in some right. ways. So. Yeah, so this is especially true. Art is a very good way to tell the story um, in this period. And I, so I, there's a lot of stuff on, on art because the sequence of art styles is very interesting to follow and then kind of coherent. And then as you say, David, what, where it comes out, it, where it begins is there's great concern about having a particular idea of what counts as a painting and what doesn't count as a painting, what counts as art and what doesn't count as art. By 1965, nobody cares anymore about that. Uh, and that's interesting to watch how that unfolds. So you get to the point where Susan Sontag writes against interpretation saying like, we should treat everything the same. We should enjoy everything equally the same. Um, nobody would say that in 1945. And you know, I think the, the concept of freedom is is one that you use to to unite many of these periods or analyses or samplings yeah. and what we just talked about in terms of art is a a progression in the post-war era to a place where freedom becomes a, a true value yeah would that be a fair way to try yeah. to think about i mean this? yeah the the obvious reason for that is that in the cold war ideologically the united states came to stand for freedom of expression yep. 
because the alternative Soviet model was that certain expressions were censored, uh, certain artists were banned, certain speakers were banned, and so forth. So, th so this was a big selling point for the U.S. and it, everybody picks up on it, and it becomes almost the slogan of the period. But what is amazing about it is that everybody uses the concept of freedom to justify whatever they stand for. So Barry Goldwater uses it. Extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Remember that, 1964. John F. Kennedy uses it. Martin Luther King Jr. uses it. George Wallace uses it. John Cage uses it. They all use it. And when you get to the period, you realize it doesn't really mean anything because it's just the way we have terms like that today that we use just to, you know, it sounds good to say, I believe in this, um, whether it makes sense or not. And this is the term that, that was such, that, that term was one of those things. But at the same time, there are genuinely interesting philosophical explorations of the concept of freedom, what it really means, and what it means about what it means to be a human being, and, and, and those are serious and interesting conversations. And and this is, I think, why um, you know delving into Arendt, uh, Sartre, De Beauvoir. I mean, my philosophical sort of bias is coming through here. That this is this is a fascinating way to pick up European influence on American thought during this period. Um, uh, how, how do you see that as as having really occurred to um, shore up this, in, in some ways, the intellectual concept of freedom? I think existentialism in the first part of the period is very influential. And the, the short answer to how is that possible is that this is what most important thing about this period is that the United States, after 1945, coming out of a period in the 30s when there was a lot of isolationist sentiment, as there always has been here, became active in international affairs. We love money to other countries. We sent our work at art and music and ideas abroad. We brought art and music from other countries here. Um, there's a huge amount of cultural exchange. It just, even though there's very limited immigration, art and ideas circulate very rapidly around the world. Japan has an influence on art in New York City. Uh, and one of the big sources of influence for American art and ideas is France. Uh, and it begins with Sartre and Beauvoir, um, yeah. and they have a philosophy of freedom. And that's exactly what's needed at this moment is sort of philosophical backup for the slogan of the free world. Mm -hmm. So it's immediately attractive to people uh, as a philosophy that deals with the concept of people as ultimately being free. Yeah. Uh, and that's very popular. They come on the scene right after the end of the war, 1945. Um, by 1947, everybody knows what existentialism is, even if they haven't read a word hmm. by Sartre and Beauvoir. They're still talking about it. So, so that was really an important chapter. Okay, and uh, you you run a through line, I think, from this to um, some of the activism of the '60s, which has its roots in a concept of freedom of expression and um, uh, more of a human rights, civil rights movement, which is based upon individual freedom as well. Yeah. Uh, with uh, yeah. Hayden in particular, I think. Yeah, Hayden was a big reader of the existentialist. Tom Hayden, the sort of one of the founders of SDS, big reader of the existentialists. He went to college at the University of Michigan in the late 50s, and he took a class with Walter Kaufman, who made this famous existentialist anthology everybody read. And so he thought of he thought of student activism in existentialist terms. In other words, it was a way for the students themselves being active on behalf, for example, of civil rights, to experience freedom, to make free choices for themselves. Um, the emphasis really was on the student, what was good for the student um, existentially. Since so that was a big influence on Hayden, and then, of course, the other new left movement that I talk about in the book is the free speech movement at Berkeley in 1964. And of course, that was all about freedom of expression. Um, so yeah, so this stuff does, it does come back um, in the early 60s. Um, I'm also interested in in your opinion of this '50s period because I think there are there are at least two lenses that we can look at this through from uh, American from the from the experience of American culture. One is it's the um, 1950s sitcom suburban white nuclear family model, and that it was a great time to look back on and people. Uh, of great nostalgia about that, or at least some people do. 
I don't share that. The other lens is one where um, it really was not a particularly inclusive time in our society. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the the what, what becomes a period of um, looking for greater civil rights, for more um, uh, vote, voter rights. The whole the whole sixty stuff comes from comes comes out of this period, and equally. Um, you know that, that this is the time that Joe McCarthy is is active as well in in some ways, so um, or beginning to be active in some ways. So I think there's there are these two sides to this early part of um, the the Cold War era, and I just like your perspective on how you reconcile yeah. those those two yeah. dimensions. Well, they're it's definitely there as you describe it. Um, I would say I don't like to over periodize things, but it's helpful to think about the period this way. For the first 10 years or so after the war, um, the uh, emphasis on anti-communism, taking form of McCarthyism, but also rhetorically in other ways, and on a kind of American way of life, as you say, which is certainly not inclusive, um, is quite dominant. Mm -hmm. After 1956, that changes a lot, and so the, my book sort of splits in half in 1956. I don't like to like say everything starts here or stops there, but that's kind of what happens. And the communist issue starts to recede. Mm -hmm. The anxiety about the fear of communism or communist infiltration or so on begins to recede. The Supreme Court starts coming down with decisions that are limiting the power of government agencies to inquire into the political beliefs of citizens. Those are very important. And then the Supreme Court starts taking on obscenity cases which open up freedom of expression for artistic expression or literature and movies. Um, that all happens after 1956, and then you start to get an opening up of, of American life. And along with that, as you point out, starting around 1956 is the emergence of the modern civil rights movement, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott, leading to the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and the beginning of the women's movement with Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique in 1963. So that, I, my book ends there to show that there's a huge change in American life from 1945 to 1965. And I'm trying to follow the dots that show how that change came about. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a good reminder that certain periodization is somewhat arbitrary when we, um, when we try and assign um, beliefs to particular periods in time. The reality is often um, a good deal more, more complicated. Yes, I, that's what I strongly believe, and I try to reproduce that in my book. You know, there's, 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 you know, there's certain ideas, there's certain figures who produce something that you could understand clearly as significant, like the drip paintings or the soup can or something, or the totalitarianism. But there's all this kind of stray voltage around at the same time that you have to, you can't put it all in your book, but you have to capture that feeling. There's lots of other stuff going on, and that's so when you're trying to put yourself in the person who's creating the thing you're interested in, you've got to reproduce a little bit this field around them, which can be quite complicated and you know full of contradictions. So I, I do I do try to capture a little bit of that in the book. As a consequence, there's probably about a thousand people in the book. <laughs> it gets very populated, but the world oh. is populated, you know. Right. But there are there is there is the the um the, some certain ideas do rise to prominence at certain times also so yeah. so I think we, we yeah so what you, what you're trying to understand historically is that uh, the social conditions that make for the possibility of a certain kind of painting or a certain kind of music or a certain kind of book and then you're looking for the person who for whatever reason comes to occupy that space and to fulfill those possibilities. So in the late 40s, just to take the Pollock example, there's a big issue about abstract painting versus representational painting or figural painting, huge debates in the New York art world about it, also in Europe, but here. And uh, there's a moment when somebody needs to break through that and create something that looks unambiguously like art. And Pollock was able to do that. Did he know he was doing that? I don't think he did really know what he was doing. What happened was he moved with his wife, Lee Krasner, who's also a important painter, moved to Long Island. And they had this house. He couldn't stretch a canvas because the walls weren't big enough. So he put it on the floor and he started throwing paint on it, with usually using a stick or a brush. And he started making the drip paintings. It was just, it was an accident, really. Um, and he didn't think, oh, I'm solving a problem in, you know, in art history. He just thought, I need to make a painting. 
And then it turned out he was really good at it because those are incredibly beautiful paintings. And he did this for three and a half years from 1947 to 1950, November 1950, and then he stopped. He couldn't do it anymore. So all the Pollock paintings are made in about three and a half year period. That's true of all these figures. The Beatles, you know, Elvis, they're only around for about three years. I mean, they're, they're around, everybody knows who they are, but they're, what they're doing that matters to people outside of their own businesses is a very short amount of time. So historically, I'm looking for what conditions made it possible, for example, Elvis to cover R&B songs and come up with rock and roll. It turns out it's a very interesting backstory to that that all kinds of things that had to happen for him to be able to do that. Was he thinking about those things? No, he's just trying to make sing a song, or make a record. He had actually no intention of singing an R&B song the first time he recorded it. He'd never sung it before in his life, but it worked. So they kept doing it and it kept working. So I'm interested in that kind of thing. I'm interested it's in like, people in that moment, yeah. There needs to be genius. Um, there needs to be the right timing. Sometimes you just have to be first. Yeah. Um, and then there has to be recognition of, of that's of right. So there also has to be a climate of reception. There has to be a critic who gets this is what this is what the drip painting is about. So people don't go, that's art. The critic comes out, yes, here's why. Or the soup can. People don't go, what's that? The critic can explain, well, this is what the soup can is about. So all these figures need somebody to explain why what they're doing counts as something important. I wouldn't say genius exactly, but definitely talent. In other words, Pollock was just incredibly good at drip paintings. They're inevitable. You think anybody could throw a paint on a campus, but you can't. And if you look at them in a museum, um, uh, you know, we have one here that's really beautiful. It's, a, it's unusual, but very narrow at the, at the um, um, Museum of Fine Arts. It's very intricate. It's hard to imagine how he did it, but he was good at it. Andy Warhol, was a great visual artist. He had great color sense, he had great compositional sense, he had good instincts as an artist. He probably would have been good in any kind of art, but it turned out he was really good at making uh, silk screens. <laughs> and that's what he mainly did. And and they're, you know, they're just they're incredible works in themselves, and they're conceptually interesting too, uh, which is also important about them. Anyway, so all these people have something to contribute, as it were. And then things align for some period of time, not terribly long, and they manage to do their thing and it, it has it, it it matters to people, has impact way beyond uh, as I said, their own their own business. So that's what I'm interested in the book. Yeah. Let, let's talk about because if I don't ask you this question, people will, will yell at me afterwards. But let, <laughs> let's talk about how the Beatles get to be in here and how um, you know how they're emblematic uh, in some ways of this uh, of this freedom, of this period of yeah. Yeah. Well, the Beatles story is is good for me because a lot of the stories I'm trying to tell, probably all of them ultimately, are about the circulation of cultural goods from one country to another and then back again. So there's a lot of this that takes place involving U.S. novels, in the case of existentialism, movies, uh, and music, to European countries who then uh, embrace it, try to imitate it, and then trying to imitate it, produce something different. And then that something different comes back here, and we're like, wow, where'd that come from? Uh, and then people try to imitate it here. So that happens with rock and roll and the Beatles. I think that's a fairly familiar story that the Beatles started as a cover band playing American rock and roll in Europe, and they were very good at it. They're very good, uh, could do very, do very good imitations of American singing. and. When they came here, they didn't really understand what Americans were interested in because they thought they were just singing American. Because they had their own songs too, of course, but but they're just singing American music. But for Americans, they look completely different. They look European, right. um, exotic. So, <laughs> so, and the same thing is true with the movies. That um, after the war, we entered into an agreement with France to loan them money to rebuild. This is before the Marshall Plan, and part of the agreement was that the French would drop their quotas on foreign movies being shown on French screens. Um, because Hollywood had lobbied to get this into the into the deal, and so there about two thousand movies were made in the United States during the period France was occupied by Germany, and so they they couldn't be seen in France. So nineteen forty six, all these American movies like Citizen Kane and The Maltese Falcon come to Paris, and these young French cinephiles like Jean Luc Godard and Francois Truffaut fall in love with French with American movies, 
A journal starts up, Cahiers du Cinéma, which celebrates American directors. Mm. Sort of a culture war in France about this. Mm. And then when those people come to make their own movies 10 years later, Godard makes Breathless in 1960, he's trying to make an American movie. He's telling a crime couple story, which is an old Hollywood genre that he knew well because he's a student of film, and he uh, makes Breathless. For Americans, there's nothing more French than Breathless. So when it comes over here, people see it like, wow, that's so French, I want to make a French movie. And they make Bonnie and Clyde. And the people who made Bonnie and Clyde, inspired by French movies, uh, David Newman and Robert Benton wrote the screenplay, showed it to Truffaut to see if he would direct it. He couldn't direct it, so they gave it to Godard to direct. They wanted to make a French movie. It finally gets made by Arthur Penn as the director. And it's, there's no more American movie than Bonnie and Clyde. So it's a great example of how there's this weird cultural misprision that takes place where one culture thinks it's imitating another culture's cultural product, but actually is getting it a little bit different or wrong. And then it goes back to the original culture and often back again. So I'm very interested in those kinds of stories, and there's a ton of them. Again, it's a function of the U.S. being actively engaged with the rest of the world, exchanging our art and ideas with other countries and take, absorbing them here, translating foreign literature, showing foreign movies. That's a very important part of this period. And all those audiences grow throughout the period, audiences for foreign films, audiences for paperback translations. Uh, it's a wonderful period of cultural flowering, uh, and that, I'm trying to capture that. In, in, in some ways, going back to our, our sort of history of ideas or intellectualist um, a, a approach to this, that's kind of like its own uh, postmodern um, way of deconstructing each other's, each other's country, uh, cultures in, in some ways, and yet uh, it also is an early form of globalization. It, it is because it's definitely a form of globalization. That's what it becomes, ultimately. Um, art becomes global. Uh, and even literary fiction is now global um, and also very corporate. So, but you see that just happening at the end of this, uh, at the end of this period, yeah. So we're gonna take some um, audience questions in just a, a minute or two, uh, but before we do that, um, um, I'd, I'd like to talk about where you decide to leave off, which is um, really at the point where, where the US uh, is getting ready to intervene in, in, in Vietnam. What, what, what is it about that period that, you know, I think um, is still an expression of, of this concept of America and the free world uh, in action? Viet so I think, I think Vietnam was a crisis for containment. So the containment theory, I think everybody knows, was to keep communism in its box. Right. And at any point where communism threatened to come out of its box and uh, infiltrate other territories, <clears throat> we would push back. It was always very unclear what, it, what that meant. Mm -hmm. Because if a communist country is sending armed forces into a non-communist country, you can't stop them by sending Louis Armstrong over. You know what I mean? You can't use cultural diplomacy for that. You basically have to respond to force with force. And I think that the U.S. didn't want to think about that until it was in Vietnam, until it was too late. By then, we committed ourselves. We've been involved in Vietnam since 1954. I mean, we've been there for a long time. Uh, then we committed ourselves to countering North Vietnamese aggression, even though North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese were the same people, uh, with force. And we couldn't get out. We didn't know how to get out. So the book ends with that in 1965, which is when the bombing campaign starts and the Marines land, with Kennan's testimony, George Kennan's testimony before the House, sorry, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 1966, in which he denounces the whole Vietnam military adventure. And they ask him, isn't that what containment meant? And he says something like, well, it's not what I anticipated or something like that. So I felt that was a good bookend since I begin with Kennan in, in the first place. Kennan clearly didn't want to go to war. His whole argument is we don't need to bomb them. They'll, they'll destroy it themselves of their own inefficiency. Mm -hmm. But with Vietnam, it became a crisis. So that was a turning point. And then I think just having lived through that period just changed everything because everything became political. Everything got extreme. Uh, American politics descended into chaos in 1968. Um, you know, there were assassinations. Uh, it was, you know, it was a bloody pretty fraught time. Very different from the early 60s, which is a time of optimism and uh, opening up and so forth. So I felt that belongs to another another book, which another person can write. 
Um, here, here's a lighter question from Michelle. She asks, was there a protagonist or were there a couple of different protagonists who really surprised you? Uh, for example, like learning that none of the Beatles knew how to read music, uh, if, if that's true. Yeah, I, so first of all, I love all my characters. Uh, I really did uh, because I was trying, as I said earlier, I think I was trying to get in their heads, to empathize with them, to understand what made them tick, so to speak, um, so that I could figure out how it was possible for them to kind of do the things they did at the moment that they did them. So they all surprised me a little bit, um, I think beginning with Pollock. Um, there's a, he has a certain reputation, which I think is just unfair. Um, he, he had an illness. He, he was an alcoholic, um, you know, and he and when he was out, when he was drunk, he was he was violent or abusive. I don't want to say violent, but streperous, difficult. And he was a binge drinker. Drinker. So when he wasn't drunk, he was a very sweet guy. Um, and I don't think his paintings are particularly macho at all. As I said earlier, they're very beautiful, delicate works. But anyway, so beginning with Pollock, uh, and then yeah, you learn something about all of them as you as you as you dive in a little bit more. To their stories, you learn a lot about them. I think the character for me who was the biggest challenge was James Baldwin, yeah. because he's just a very complicated personality, and I felt I really had to get figure out what what made him tick. You know what he was up to, to understand why he was so important in the sort of period around 1960, 1963. Uh, Fire Lake's time comes out in 1963, and he's he's his famous. It's faces on the cover of Time magazine and everything. So how did that happen? Um, so that was a challenge and that was very, for me, it was very rewarding because I think I never really got what James Ball was all about. So, so what, what did you learn about, about James in, 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 the, in the research then? He, uh, he <laughs> I have to put it in a thumbnail, but he, the way I put it, I think in the book is that he wanted to be respected for a person who didn't need the respect of other people. Um, that, it's compl that's a complicated idea, but it's a real idea. I, a lot, a lot of, I think a lot of people have that idea. Um, so it would always put him in a perilous position because he's in a weird way wanting respect and also doesn't, he doesn't need it. Um, so that's, I think, part of the psychological thing of it. Um, he also was a brilliant speaker, I think, as everybody knows. If you not, go on YouTube and you can hear some of his extemporaneous speeches, because he was a boy preacher in Harlem. His father was a preacher at Pentecostal church, and he just was really good at extemporary speaking. Uh, and I think he was also a great journalist. Uh, I think his journal journalism is more important than his novels. Um, and The Fire Next Time is an incredible essay about Elijah Muhammad and what's going on. So he, you know, so he really, and he was a truth teller about that. He wasn't always a truth teller about his own life, but he, you know, he saw things with, the, he, he was not afraid just to call them like he saw them. And it gets him into trouble eventually. The other thing about Baldwin, which is really important because it's why Baldwin has come back um, with um, Black Lives Matter and on AC Coates and so forth is because his message was white people have a problem. They should fix their problem. And then, they could, then they could deal with the problem of race relations because there's something wrong with white people and white people didn't want to hear that. White liberals didn't want to hear they were complicit in the regime of white supremacy. And he told them that, and they didn't like that. So he, but after 1963, he actually gets sort of marginalized because he loses his white audience. And then he goes, he becomes, he's pushed to the extreme. So he sympathizes with the Panthers and so forth. Um, people who I think quite different from the Baldwin of the 50s uh, because he wants to identify with, with people who know the black experience because that's what he, that's what he stands for. This is what it's like to be black in America. He thinks those people also understand that. Um, but it pulls him in a direction that, in which he increasingly loses his relevance for the white audience. So that's, I try to tell that story a little bit. So he's a fascinating, fascinating yeah, it, guy. It, it may very well be that one of the things that comes out of the last 12 months is that we white people are more open to hearing that message than perhaps yeah. at any time in the past. Exactly, right. And, but anyway, I think, and I think that's why Baldwin has had a resurrection. Ad asks a question about the relationship between freedom and the concept of community. So some of our later existentialists are going to just love this. Um, but um, it, her words are, with the concept of freedom being used to justify so much, and that's what we kind of do as a unifying theme in the book, 
Um, but where does the concept of community come in? Could it be that community lost ground to freedom, I assume individual freedom, um, and that to this extent that that's what we're living with the effects of today? That's a great question. And I think it's, I think it's a good, it's a good um, perception that uh, community, we could call it equality, we call it social justice, uh, gets a little bit secondary to this concept of individual freedom. I think what makes this complicated for us today is that freedom is a slogan on the right. So freedom not to wear a mask, you know, freedom to carry a gun. Uh, on the left or progressive side, it is about equality and social justice. It's not really about individual liberty. That's become kind of a right wing uh, slogan in the U.S. now. So when we look back on this earlier period, as I think your question suggests, we're like, well, wait a minute, are those the right priorities? Are we missing something by emphasizing individual liberty and so on, freedom of expression over other values? Do they get a little bit sidelined? So I, I think I think that's, a, I think, as I say, I think that's probably right. Uh, and as I say, from our point of view, we can kind of get what was, what was dangerous about that. Right. And, and yes, um, through this phase of individualism, we also get civil rights movement and other um, other movements that um, are about lifting everybody up. Um, yeah, that's true. It's true, but it's also but it is in the name of freedom. So, for example, in the "I Have a Dream" speech in August 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. used the word equality once. He used the word freedom twenty times. And Martin Luther King Jr. was for equality. Right. Equality was the slogan of the old civil rights movements before King came along. But I think he saw that the language of freedom was just a much better language to use to get the attention of the federal government and, and of white people. Because we think of freedom as a kind of zero sum good. Everybody, you know, it's just like lighting candles. You could just keep lighting candles. Everybody, freedom for everybody is fine. It's not really true, but you could think of it that way. But equality implies redistribution. Right. Distribution is not popular in in this country, so I think King knew what he was doing when he when he used the word freedom uh, more, more, much more frequently than he used the term or concept of equality. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, it, there is a good outcome in the sense, same thing with the women's movement. There's a good outcome in the sense that in the name of liberty, people are claiming a social right, right. Uh, claiming a right to be treated equally, um, but. You know, but it's so it's complicated, uh, just as it's complicated today. I'm, I'm reminded of Eric Fromm's take on freedom, which is that we, we should not be talking about freedom as freedom from things, but freedom for something, uh, yeah. which which begins to take us in the direction of of community. But yeah, this um, is very much a freedom from period. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. Um, Eric asks, um, do you have a particular research method for this kind of work? Because your, your style and your composition is clearly unique in the assembly of these characters and protagonists. And so um, what's, what's your research method for this? Yeah, I think Beth is, is a nice word for it. Um, <laughs> I, uh, in this case, I started with reading the biographies because I, as I said, I want to kind of get the person I'm going to use for the, to tell the story around. So I start with that, um, and then I and then I try to tap into the scholarship. All the people I write about have had thousands of things written about them. So there's a huge library, uh, every figure, um, and uh, so I you know I try to be responsible and understand what the history of the scholarship is. And then the last twenty years, there have been a lot of really interesting books written about the Cold War period that aren't stuck in a kind of Cold War within a Cold War battle. Uh, that is, they're more disinterested in trying to understand what's going on, and I, I refer to those books in my footnotes, and I learn a lot from them, and I follow a lot of their arguments in my own book. Um, so once I feel I've kind of got where the scholarship is, yeah. and I feel comfortable with the person I'm writing about, so I've read their work, and then I then I start writing. And as you know, as you write, I'm a person who just writes one sentence at a time. I don't go back really. So as you write, you realize, oh, I need to know about this, or I need to look up that. So I'm sitting right now in my office, which is in Widener Library at Harvard, and it, this is a fantastic scholarly research. I mentioned it in my acknowledgments. I mean, my first acknowledgment is this library, because 
it's just everything I needed, I just had. I'll give you an example of that. There's a chapter on structuralism, which I noticed we didn't talk about. And uh, one of the main figures in that chapter is a linguist named Roman Jakobson. Yeah. And he was living in Czechoslovakia in the 1920s. He belonged to the Prague Linguistic Circle. And he is supposed to be the person who coined the term structuralism uh, to describe the kind of linguistics that they were doing, structural linguistics. And he did this in an article that was published in a Czech periodical in the 1920s. And my office happens to be in the Slavic section of Harvard Library. Uh -huh. I walked out of my office, 10 feet away is that periodical. I could take uh -huh. it off the shelf. It's incredible. So, um, so I just feel unbelievably lucky to have this resource and, and I used it. You know, I got so much out of it. Um, but that's why it took a long time to write the book. I say, I like to say there's 18 chapters. I felt like I was climbing Mount Everest 18 times. <laughs> um, this, this, there's a, a question from Gary, which is really about, who, um, in some ways, who you chose to leave out a different point, because I'm sure there were many more characters. In, in his case, the question is about, um, for the Kennan chapter, why uh, the Secretary of Defense, uh, Paul Nietzsche, was, uh, was left yeah. out, for example. Yeah, he's in there briefly, um, Paul Nietzsche. Uh, he's important, as you, as you know, person asked the question, because he really um, comes to, he kind of replaces Kennan ultimately, mm -hmm. and he comes to create the conditions for the national security state, so the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the CIA, um, uh, all the, you know, all the paraphernalia of the national security state, he's really, you know, he's the author of that. Um, and that's a good contrast with Kennan, who sort of tries to shy away from those issues. Um, not that he wasn't involved to some extent. So, so yeah, I could have had something on him. You know, there, I could have write 18 more chapters, and there's a lot of things that I left out. One thing I wanted to do, a chapter mm. was the relationship between U.S. and Japan, um, mm. because Japanese art was really interesting in the 50s and early 60s, and it's related to the U.S. occupation and rebuilding of Japan, um, and then has a big influence on American musicians and artists who go over to Japan, Japanese come over here. Um, that's a good story that I just uh, didn't have the bandwidth to, to tell. And then there's a million things. Everybody reading the book will think, what about jazz? You know, what about Anne Rand? Or, right. you know, yeah, you know, I wish. But I but, did try to- You're the author, so you get to choose, right? Well, I, I, I tried to choose to tell, to get a story out of it. So I, I didn't want to get sidetracked. There's certain things that probably that are relevant to the period, but don't really get you, get me where I wanted to get. I want the reader, I think of it as like, I want the reader to feel the earth turning at street level. <laughs> so the earth is turning right now, but we don't feel it. And the people in this period don't feel it, but actually there's this change going on. So I wanted to give the sensation to the reader of things changing uh, while staying true to the experience of the individuals who are part of that change. We have two questions that are coming back to the anti-communist um, sort of dimension of, of, of some of the some of the periods you study. So Liam asks, um, uh, you dedicate the book to your father, Louis Menand III, who you describe as a civil libertarian, environmentalist, anti-anti-communist. Yeah. Um, and why was your father an anti-anti-communist? If uh, if that's a question you're comfortable uh, uh, oh, answering. Oh, I put it in the book. Uh, he yeah. was. So my dad was a New Deal liberal. Um, and in the 50s and 60s, that is kind of a left position in American politics. Um, so he was, he was a man of the left. Um, and uh, he was against the national security state. He was against the arms buildup, and he was against loyalty oaths and uh, McCarthyite witch hunts. He wrote his dissertation on loyalty oaths. So, and he blocked the ACLU. So he, th this was a big thing for him. That thinking about what it means to be an anti-anti-communist doesn't mean you're pro-communist. Right. That would be different. <laughs> be communist. It, it means that you're against the people who make everything into some form of anti-communism. And the crisis, so this develops within the Democratic Party about 1948, the split between anti-communists and anti-anti-communists. And it blows up in Vietnam because the anti-communists are interventionists and the anti-anti-communists like my dad are anti-interventionists. Uh, and that's where, that's what happens in Chicago in 1968. Those two forces just smash into each other and kind of ruin the Democratic Party. Um, so, so yes, so I lived through that part of watching my dad. Yeah. 
Um, th this second question, which I, I must say is a, a topic I'm not familiar enough, so uh, please do with this as you will, um, but um, uh, asks if you could speak to the dichotomy between the freedom of abstract expressionism and the realism that came out of the anti-communist le leanings. Uh, this is in reference to the IRA Writers Workshop, if that's uh, an area that you Oh, know. yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh... So the Iowa Writers Workshop um, really booms in this post-war period, um, al along with a lot of other creative writing programs. And part of the reason for that is that <clears throat> returning GIs who can go to school in the GI Bill, a lot of them want to do creative writing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of creative writing programs come into existence to satisfy this demand. And then uh, there's a whole book on this by Mark McGurl called The Program Era, which he discusses the way that all American literature eventually gets funneled through these writing programs where people go to get a credential to become writers and they're taught by people who have got a credential from some MFA, MFA program somewhere else. So that's a big phenomenon in this period. Um, and there's evidence that the CIA fund helped fund subvert, uh, covertly the Iowa Writers Program because it had an international dimension. Um, Paul Engel, who's the guy who ran it, was interested in reaching out internationally for the program. Uh, so I think, I think yeah, I probably did fund it a little bit. Um, the question about Jackson Pollock, though, is um, so that's a good question because it, yeah, there's somewhat different aesthetics there. The thing about Pollock, though, is that I don't think of the drip paintings as free um, because you uh, you have to be incredibly disciplined to make art that that way. Um, you can't erase it, so whatever splash ends up on the canvas, you have to work with that. And then you just make another splash. So that's what's amazing about them is that they seem feel incredibly organic. But how did he do that? Um, so I think the drip paintings require tremendous discipline. They're not permissivists at all. For, mm -hmm. The reason I gave earlier is you can't imitate them. A similar is the case of Jack Kerouac writing on the road, which is around the same time as the drip paintings, around 1952, when he wrote it. I think it published in 1957. You know, he, he put a piece of uh, teletype paper in his typewriter with and he just kept typing. Uh, and it's called the scroll. It actually exists. I think it's owned by the guy who owns the Indianapolis Colts or something like that. I've seen it. He was near a public library. He had a display of it. It's just this huge roll of paper um, with kind of no paragraphs or anything. Um, so there's some canards about that, one of which is that he made it all up sitting at the typewriter. But actually, he'd been trying to write the novel for years uh, in other ways. So he had a whole stack of notebooks and drafts and stuff next to him. So he was basically riffing on what he'd already written. He wasn't making it up on the spot. But also, like the drip painting, it's very hard to write that way because you can't go back. Right. So everything you write, you have to do something with to get to the next sentence. Um, so I think these were highly disciplined. Same thing with Cage. So Cage's music sounds very random, or Rauschenberg's art looks very random. It's not random at all. There's a really conscious effort to produce the work in a certain way. Cage's way was using flipping coins to decide what the pitch of the note was going to be and so on. Uh, Rauschenberg had different methods, but it's very hard to do art that way, even if it looks anarchic or random or you know uh, free form. It's usually not. Um, there's a good book by a guy named Dale Belgrad called The Culture of Spontaneity about this period, but I actually don't think it's very spontaneous. Same thing true with jazz. It's hard to play jazz. It's not, you're not just riffing without thinking. You're actually, you have to have, understand the music and, you know, follow the changes and so forth to be able to produce those things. So it's interesting that the, all this work has a reputation of being free form and so forth. I don't think it was at all. Um, look, we're, we're coming up on time. Um, and so I, I want to um, end with a, a, a question of my, my own, if I can, which is, um, you know, much of, of what current dis discourse is, is trying to work out, who are we as the United States? Who are we as Americans today? And I'm just wondering if there are one or two things that from this period that you're, you're looking at here, if there are a couple of things that you think we should be paying particular attention to to learn from. Yeah, good. Thank you. That's a good question. I think two things. Uh, one is that in 1945, the world had been through a depression that lasted almost 10 years, and then a war, world war that lasted almost six years. And everywhere in the free world, people wanted a fresh start. So it was a struggle to overcome the residue of wartime conditions, particularly in Western Europe. But when they did, 
things boomed and people thought we can we can start all over again people thought we can reinvent the idea of art uh you know we can reinvent philosophy um it's a very exciting moment and good things came of that even though a lot of bad stuff came along with it but um so looking so i feel when i finished the book and then was in production and everything biden got elected president i had this experience which probably we've all had or sympathetic to biden's politics this is a this is a fresh start we're coming out from under this cloud of nativism and nationalism and isolationism and we actually we can start all over again we can rethink what government's all about i'm crossing my fingers that this is going to last but just at the moment it feels like oh this is there's an opportunity here. So it's good to look back and see what people in 1945 and after made of their opportunity. Uh, it's, good, it's good to look at. Second thing is, the reason I think that this is such an interesting period culturally is because we reached out to the rest of the world. We invited the rest of the world here, uh, or at least the culture of the rest of the world here. We shipped our culture out to the world, and we wanted to be a player in global affairs. You could say that ended in bad ways, no doubt, but, but it was something that we should return to. It's just much healthier. And one thing that teaches us is there isn't any such thing as American culture. It's not, you can't think of culture that way. You have to think of it as something that's produced by artists and thinkers all over the world. And the greater rate of exchange that we have with those people, the more our own uh, writers and artists here will flourish. Um, so that's another hopeful sign of the new administration is that they're, they're thinking about our relationships with the rest of the world again. Well, that's a great optimistic note to end on. I'll ask Mel to come back to close us out in a second, but thank you so much for the conversation. I, I feel like we've just crammed 18 conversations into one yeah. 60, 60 minute period. So I just encourage everybody to go buy the book or borrow the book or uh, find a way to read the book. So Lou, Lou, okay thank you so much. From, it's okay to borrow from the Boston Public Library. Uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you to David and thank you for all who Zoomed in with us. No. And thank you, gentlemen. Thanks so much to you both, Luke and David. And uh, this is, I, I was already eager to read the book and now my head is just bursting and this is fantastic. So uh, thanks to both of you and thanks to all of you at home for joining us. I posted a link in the chat one last time, a link to learn more about the book and to purchase the book. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore and uh, me beaming in from Nashville tonight. Have a wonderful evening. Keep reading, stay safe. And thanks again to both of you. Bye.